Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, the 16th of October. Welcome back to the D3D4 football podcast dedicated to all things Leagues 1 and 2. We have four of us on this call today to review the third and fourth divisions. It is myself, Edward Walker, joined by David Jenkin and James Richards first. David, how are you doing this week? Yeah, could be doing better, mate. But um, yeah, overall, I uh, can't really complain. It's been it's been an all right a uh, couple of weeks, uh, six games unbeaten now for the Jills, so we're we're on the up. When was the last time you had six games unbeaten? Absolutely, oh, for the Jills. Yeah, no idea, mate. I know. <laughs> I think the last time we had this sort of run in the league was last year in April, was it? Oh, something, something like that. But yeah, really impressive, James. Yourself, how's it going? Yeah, good. Hectic life, but in terms of the football, much much happier after a, a nice performance at Exeter yesterday and. Um, up to the heady heights of 19th. Brilliant. I'm sure you'll have plenty to talk about that indeed. We've also got another person joining us today. Please welcome James Beck. James, how are you doing yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, really excited to, to obviously be on. Um, football not going too well for, for my team crew at the moment. Um, a tough trip to, to Tranmere on Friday night has sort of ruined my weekend, but you know, here we are. You've got a great first name though, so there you go. Yeah, we're suffering. <laughs> we're suffering with a bit of a James overload right now. I've got James at home as well. I've got two James on this call as well. There's just there's just too many of you to go around. So James Demick. <laughs> James, I call I call the group there a we have for that. I don't know. I just <laughs> <laughs> I call the group we have double J J Epody just to try and emphasise the number of J's. But we'll get around. I think we'll go J R and J B is how we're going to try and separate them when it comes to talking about reviews today. So we'll we'll see how well that goes. Uh, reminder before we get going, this podcast is in partnership with the Big Step, which tackles football's relationship with gambling. There is an excessive presence of gambling adverts within football, and the Big Step continues to do great work to raise awareness about the dangers of gambling and the impact it can have on so many people's lives. A big thank you as well to all our Patreon members and James R. I believe we have more to shout out today. Yeah, thank you for all of you who have joined up uh, in the last couple of weeks for the D3D4 dailies. It's Jacob Weller, Ryan Whelan, Max Kennedy, Niall Constance, Martin Stewart, Joe Holbrook, Ethan Clark, Thomas Templeton, Matthew McPake, Lee Beatty, James Clark, Martin Weller and Lee Rooney. It's a start uh, exile that, isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's a, it's a good, that's a good solid, lovely, good solid EFL team there. <laughs> it's brilliant. But awesome. yeah, I really appreciate you guys uh, supporting the pod and hope you're enjoying, uh, enjoying the D3D4 dailies. And of course, if you want any particular subjects covered in them, just uh, drop us a message on Patreon uh, and we'll endeavour to do that for you. Yeah, there's nothing we love more than talking about League One and League Two teams, especially in James's case, it's Oxford United. And yeah, if anyone wants like a, a definitive history of Oxford in the 90s, <laughs> I'm open to doing a three hour you know d3 d4 daily on that though my wife might have something to say about that. Have but, an hour yeah. section on kevin francis alone yeah well yeah that's it <laughs> absolutely we'll get going and we'll begin with the world's best third tier league one, league one we're going to begin with you jr and we're going to talk about cheltenham town one bristol rovers four yeah, turn up, turn up for the books in uh, in League One. Really, yesterday was the number of teams away from home who, by half time, were, were leading. It was uh, a pretty uh, dominant first half performance in in some respects, I'd say, from Bristol Rovers in the fact that every time they had a shot, they practically scored. And Cheltenham were their own worst enemies. Um, you know, seven conceded in the last two. Individual errors were really the issue here. If you, you saw the first goal, Ryan Jackson and uh, just. And the goalkeeper just didn't know whose ball it was. And um, uh, Aaron Collins sneaks in to score. He had even Caleb Taylor for the fourth goal, making a terrible error of judgment with he, where he missed the header. And they, they broke three, three again to score. Bad marking from set pieces. Um, but credit to Bristol Rovers because Aaron Collins has now got eight goals and six assists in 14 games, which is absolutely outrageous. Uh, they were extremely clear. They had five shots in the game, four on target, scored four goals. Um it's easy to say, well, you know, they were a bit lucky because of that. But I think in the second half, if they would needed to, they could have carried on attacking. But being 4-0 up, it changed the dynamic of the game somewhat. They were able to sit back. They were able to absorb some of the pressure and let uh, let Cheltenham come on to them. Liam Serkin with the penalty in the in the second half to sort of bring a little bit of respectability to the scoreline. He wrestled the ball away from uh, and Lundu to, to, to make sure he, he stepped up to score. But... The Cheltenham back-to-back defeats a little bit disappointing from their perspective because, you know, they had looked like they were on a real rise at one point. Um, and I don't think, you know, I think the way that it's quite 
right. There's nothing to be too concerned about um, because overall, as a team, they played reasonably well. It's just, like I said, the shocking defending. Um, and you're not going to get individual errors like that every week. For Barton's side, he's getting players back. He's got um, a decent squad now to call upon. I think when you look at the players that he's been missing, they have made a difference almost immediately. And when James Belshaw gets a primary assist in this game, you know it's going to be your afternoon because, um, you know, that's just the nature of, of how they were playing. But it's nice to see they've got, they're playing this sort of three, sorry, they're playing this sort of back four with three uh, midfielders sitting in front of it and then a number 10 with two strikers. Um, the number 10 role was played by Sam Finley yesterday, allowing Aaron Collins to play up front with Ryan Loft and they, they caused problems all game long. Rossiter Coots and Evans are the, are the sort of the three midfielders. You've got two who you'd say would be fairly defensive minded, maybe in Rossiter and Coots, but Evans can get forward there, uh, on the sort of the left side of that three. And he, he is so creative. He causes a lot of problems. And then with Gibbons and, and Gordon as wingbacks or sort of attacking fullbacks, it, it's kind of working for, for Bristol Rovers it right looks now. Like and I 11. Think it does look a really good eleven. Well, they've got, and if you look at the bench, they finally got people on that bench that you think, okay, you know, you've got McCormack there, uh, Harry Anderson, uh, Coburn who can come on. Hall is an actual defender to have on the bench rather than having to necessarily put someone like um, Glenn Whelan as centre back. You know, they do have options now, and that's what they've lacked this season just because of the injuries they've picked up. And I think um, it they'll be fine now. They'll start moving up the table. Like, it'd be interesting to see how far this Bristol Rovers team can go, uh, but with with Someone like Aaron Collins in the form he's in, um, you know, you know, the fact they're missing John Marquez, you wouldn't notice, and and that's a that's a sign of uh, of how how good they are at the moment going forward. So yeah, very good result for for Bristol Rovers and Joe Barton. It's now about building on this and and finding a bit of consistency. It is indeed. I've always said how much I love Aaron Collins. I was a really big fan of him in the back end of his time at Forest Green Rovers, and not really surprised to see him doing what he can do for Bristol Rovers. Really, I think he's great. Whether as a forward off the left hand side in a advanced role behind a striker as well, he's, he's very very good on the left. Probably the star as well. man for Bristol yeah. Rovers at the moment, wouldn't you say, James? He he's the star player in this team for yeah. sure, and uh, you know he he was actually really good for them at the end of last season. It just he's very creative. Um, he's got great tenacity he's good on the ball he works hard and he's got an eye for goal which you know when you've got a player like that who's unpredictable and difficult to defend against it can draw players in and allow space it's for the way he and... drifts is what i find he's really hard to mark because yeah, when he, he when he plays off the front line he just drifts in space it reminds me a bit of what i saw with matt j at times for exeter back in league two they've been using him as a 10 mostly so mm. it's surprising to see him move into attack because he's been very effective as a 10 or out on that left but you know, it's that's a testament to his versatility, isn't it? He's a very good player. Yeah, really good. Thornal up at half time to Bristol Rovers. That's not the first time they've been Thornal up at half time, by the way, away from home either. They did it for Burton in the second game of the season. So another great win on the road to Bristol Rovers away at Cheltenham Town. David, Milton Keynes Dons one, Plymouth Argyle four. Yeah, um just a poor season continuing for MK Dons, really. Um, you know, they're they're currently experiencing their worst run. Um, well, their worst start to a season in their entire history. Um, I mean, we, we just have to look back to the end of last season when, uh, final day of the season, they beat Argyle 5 0 to stop them from making the playoffs. Then, then you look at it now, um, a complete opposite turnaround, really. And I think this is kind of a little bit of an ode to the, to the Cheltenham Bristol Rovers game. Um, just individual mistakes and just kind of dawdling on the ball. Um, MK continuing to kind of want to play out from the back, which is fine, but they just don't seem to to be able to do it at the moment. Um, and they don't, and they don't have the players to do it almost since <laughs> since losing some of their key guys, like Harry Darling, and that. But this is it, they they try and play the same way, but I, I looked at it and I thought they just don't have the ability to do it, and they, they're making these errors in, against very very good sides. It's, oh dear. Well, this is the trouble, isn't it? Like, it's all well and good, like, having the style that you've played for the last few seasons. That's absolutely fine. But if you don't, impl- like, if you don't bring in players, as you say, like, the correct players to replace those to continue that style, you have to change something. Um, and this just shows just a sheer lack of, of, of any sign of, sign of wanting to do that. I mean, the They're first. Stuck in this middle ground, aren't they? Being not able to play the site kind of technically gifted and attacking football they were last year but they're not a physical side either so they they can easily get bullied by a more physical side they're just in that dangerous middle area where it's very easy to exploit their weaknesses and teams are doing it every week it's quite a lack of identity at the moment i would say like they're they're not really sure what they are and i suppose like you know um they're, they're kind of I would say they're sort of a transitioning team but what they're transitioning to i don't even think they're aware of yet 
Um, but um, yeah, I mean, Jamie Cummings uh, for the first goal, just, you know, a really tame shot from Whitaker, but he just fumbles it into the, fumbles it into his it's own. It's a howler, net. isn't just, it? Yeah. It is like, and, and for me, it's just the fact that he looks around in complete disbelief and just like, well, what's just happened? But you, you've just made the mistake. Um, yeah, and not not too long later, I mean, it's just the quality of Plymouth at this point. Um, some really good uh, interchanging play from Whitaker and Azaz uh, to set up Niall Ennis for the finish. Um, Azaz would then make it free before half time himself. Um, this was the first of the the two goals that were kind of Argyle um, jumping on mistakes from MK. Like they're trying to play out from the back, just get caught caught in possession, ball one back, um, played through to Finisaz, who just uh, makes it free before the half. Um, who, had Greg... the, who had the worst mistakes yesterday in possession, Cheltenham or MK? Because it feels like they're ones to both. I would, I would imagine probably MK because I, it, I just it, think MK didn't learn. I mean, they, 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 in that second half, that's that goal. They made the, the same mistake twice. Yeah, it, it was exactly the same mistake, just for two different goals, really. Um, you know, um, Plymouth, Plymouth did you know sort of get punished slightly for a consolation goal, but um, you know, Will Grigg being played in by Barry um, slots it into the bottom right corner. But you know, then it just same old story for MK Dons. Um, the fourth comes after good pressure, but really, it's more of a defensive mistake. I mean, I, I would say more communication than anything else. No one's told him the man's there. Um, get gets the ball stolen again, played through to his eyes, scores his brace, and. Argyle onto nine games unbeaten, but um... they're missing players as well. Argyle, aren't they? I mean, if you think they've got Dan Scar suspended, they've got James Fulton still out with that broken foot. Um, I think McCauley Gillespie's out with a groin injury, so they've got three of their defensive players out. Now they went with Wilson and Longwick as their centre backs yesterday uh, in a in a back four, which is the first time they've played that I think this season. And... I think they did against Wickham as well. Oh, maybe yeah, and, but I mean, it's it you know they're able to change it up and. Um, and not miss a beat. It's, 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 a, it's a real testament to what Schumacher has been able to do since he's come into this side, really. If you look even from, you know, even from the end of last season, the gr- recruitment they've done in the summer to go from sort of being in a situation, I suppose MK Duns are a, a much changed team as well. So the result kind of at the end of last season is, is probably null and void at this point. But, um, you know, if you, if you compare the two performances from like, they're, they're almost chalk and cheese, really, especially from an MK perspective. They had Cosgrove on for all of three minutes and he didn't score, which is just really poor from him, isn't it? It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I quite like this um, tweet from Franco Volpe that I think really sums up MK Dons right now. They were 3 0 down at half time, couldn't string two passes together, and there were two people at the front of the stand in front of him playing Connect Thor. Because it was just more <laughs> interesting for them than being an MK Dons stand at the moment. Oh, yeah. they, they really are a shadow of the team. And Is it revenge the Plymouth Argyle? Maybe you could say that from last season, but I mean, Argyle, sensational at the minute continue to lead the way just yeah, a really comfortable win for them against an MK side really really poor in possession really disappointed to them and they stay inside the relegation zone JB talk to me about the absolute madness that was Accrington Stanley nil Derby County 3 yeah so it was a a, a Paul Warren performance um, a complete so what do you expect of a Paul Warren side they had less of the ball um, but they were they were great on the counter Mendes Lang and, and Asula particularly were really stretching Accrington. Um, sort of 15 minutes in, great work from Mendes Lang who, who cut inside from the right hand side, uh, threaded the ball through for Asula who found himself a yard with a nice step over and slotted in across the keeper. Um, and if his performance yesterday is anything to go by, he's a, he's a real talent as, as Asula. Yeah, where does he come from? I mean, you know, he's not played much this season, but the fact that Derby can sort of call upon um, talents like that and, and you know, and, and take advantage because obviously James Collins is still suspended and I think Goldrick had, has had uh, fitness issues this season. Yeah. So they need they need something else to, to sort of rely on for their goals. No, Goldrick's uh, sort of played about 20 minutes here, but they, they do need another option. I think that's their, their sort of weakest area, so to speak. Yeah, and he's, he's completely different to McGoldrick and... And yeah. Collins as well. He can really stretch a team. Um, he's fast. Um, but shortly after that, McConville should have should have scored for for the first time um, and and hit the bar from a low driven cross from the from the right hand side. And 
similarly to, to Scott Cashkit's miss that we'll go on to earlier, or really uh, later, sorry, um, Sean McConville really should have equalised for, for Accrington and then came sort of a crazy 10 minutes just before the, the, the end of the first half. It's where... the most ridiculous five minute spell I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? So the first penalty was really soft, and, uh, and the referee didn't didn't seem to know what decision to make. It seemed like he, he had a call in his ear to give the penalty, but it was really soft. And to be honest, I I don't really see, you know, how it was a penalty. But McConville stepped up, pa- basically passed it to to um, to Will Smith in goal for for Sheffield Wednesday. It was a really poor penalty. Um, and then a couple of minutes later, another another penalty. At this time, it was a definite penalty, and, and Curtis Davis was sort of really lucky not to be sent off. I thought, and, and John Coleman definitely thought that as well after the game. Um, and I didn't think it was possible for for McConville to to hit. That, that was a blatant red card. Wasn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. It, it, well, if if we talked about the the referee at these levels, then you know we, we wouldn't have. To do anything else, but um, yeah, McConville stepped up again, and it was even worse this time. He dragged it off target, and then the next minute, Derby went down the other end. A long clearance, which again, Asula just straight in behind, so fast, so direct, took a touch again, burst through, and finished brilliantly. It was really, really good counter attacking play from a, a Paul Warren side, which you sort of come to expect in League One. I did like uh, the uh, ITV matchday commentator saying that no one wanted to get a, a lift home from Sean McConville after the game. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to vi- that right, five mate. minute long video unedited of that five minute yeah. sequence. I just want to see everything go from end to end. It's, it's absolutely bonkers. Yeah, that'd be a, a, a viral clip, I'm sure. Um, but Derby just looked really sharp down the down the wings, I thought, and Asula and Mendes Lang just. Really, really stretched Accrington. The young centre half pairing really didn't have a clue, sort of, how to deal with him, uh, Asula. And you know, I, I really felt for them, and I bet they were they were tired at, at the at the ninety plus ten. I think they had to play. And they've done. Um, they've done. To be honest, Douglas Farm and, and and Ashley, they've done pretty well this season, yeah. considering they're so young and uh, they've not got many EFL appearances between them. I think oh. this is a this is a sign that they would like to get their experienced guys back uh, as yeah. soon as possible, just just so that they can take a bit of the pressure off these two. I think one of the, one of them next to Michael Nottingham would be brilliant, to be honest. You know, it could be it could be either of them. Well, it's a book. shame Jay Rich Bagger who's out for so long, isn't it, James? Yeah, because the injury got so yeah. into the season. Well, he's out for this. He's out for the season. They should have um, the the left back. Uh, his name escapes me at the moment, um, but he, he, they've got a couple of players coming back soon and that might be important I don't know what Nottingham um, sort of timeline for return is yeah I think he's still in the boot at the moment yeah I think so. they need him back they do. not any time soon I don't think do you um, guys reckon McConville will ever be on a penalty again <laughs> I always find it weird if a player misses a penalty and they get another one that they get another chance at it well supposedly After... it's a redemption chance isn't it but uh, yeah. I mean this one's even the second one's even worse than the first I think because he's such a big player for them, they, you know, he, he it's hard to criticise him for for messing up in this game when he's in certain matches, even this season, been the key player that's got them something out of nothing. It's it's, you know, I feel a bit I feel a bit mean to have a go at Sean McConville for Rackham because he is that that kind of player that's just been so important to them over the years. Yeah, and then sort of the the last couple of minutes of the game, I think there was, there was ninety plus ten, um, the last seconds of the game, Derby. Broke again, and, and Louis Sibley, who was he was absolutely brilliant yesterday. He really ran the show. Um, he's got a wand of a left foot, and he he broke really well. I'm surprised he had any energy left at that point. Beat a few, took a shot, which rebounded perfectly to to Barcus and to to get his first for for Derby and get a really really nice three points before a, a tricky game against Ipswich on Friday night and. I think that puts them up to ninth now. Um, yeah, back to back away wins as well, and they've been waiting for yeah. away wins all season. They, they look, they're looking good on the road now, and that that Port Vale feat's really the only blemish on Paul Warren's time at Derby at the moment. Yeah, well, John Coleman after the game as well was was um, he was really angry <laughs> and rightly so because Accrington they were they were good, and on another day it could have been could have been a different game, but but Derby were really clinical. 
Um, and every time they sort of broke, they, they, they looked like scoring. Um, but, but yeah, I don't think it, it's, it's now six goals, um, without Accrington scoring back. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a worry for them, but I'm sure, you know, when they, when they, uh, and they play next week. I'm sure they'll 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 be a lot better than they were today. Mm, a great away day at the Wham Stadium for the Ramstans and a truly bonkers third star sequence really that will be part of what we call football heritage. I think Mourinho would say it is. It's incredible really what's happened there. James Richards, Exeter City two, Oxford United Thor. Yeah, Exeter. Uh, it looks to me, I'll be I'll be very honest, that they they didn't. Despite scoring two goals, they really didn't turn up. They look like a side at the moment at the ceiling of where this squad in its current condition, injuries wise, can take them. Um, they lacked energy. They were poor on the ball. Their passing was off. They didn't really create anything. And, you know, th- they had to have uh, Harry Kite playing as the right centre back. Um, Josh Key uh, before the game had to be benched because he was ill. They had uh, Pierce Sweeney playing despite being ill and he couldn't even last the first half. So, that, you know, when you look at that, they're missing Czech Diabate, Jonathan Ground, Sam Stubbs already. Key going off, and Pierce Sweeney having to leave in the first half. Um, you know, who was replaced by, I thought Edward James did quite a good job, but you could see Oxford were able to exploit their back line um, fairly straight. It was a fairly straightforward win. I never thought Oxford had to get out of second gear to get the goals that they were scoring. And Carl Joseph had a great game. I mean, his his energy... His tenacity, the way he doesn't stop running, um, he even got almost knocked out at one point and carried on. I mean, the guy's the guy's something else. And Cameron Brannigan as well, um, netting his sixth goal in the league this season with a, another really good performance at, from from deep midfield, running the show for Oxford. Um, still no League One goals for for Matty Taylor. I mean, he had a good game harassing the the extra back line and putting a good shift. And I think Marcus McGuane's Oxford's most improved player. He's defensively much more savvy really quite confident when he has the ball and keeps possession moving. And this was a, a really comfortable win for Oxford. You know, it's disappointing that we allowed Exeter to score two goals. A shout to Sonny Cox, as 18-year-old, getting his first mm. uh, goal in, at senior football, which he took, I thought, really calmly. Um, but Oxford were, were much, much better this week than they were against Wickham. We we opened the, the play up, I think, having um, James Henry playing deeper. He had a really good game in midfield. Marcus Brown... Uh, was a, was a threat down that left hand side, and our back line looks a little bit more settled now. We've got Elliot Moore back. Um, you know, we've got Longmore, Finley, and Brown. That looks like yeah, being our back It's nice four. looking at the eleven and actually seeing people in comfortable positions. Yeah, it feels it feels much better now. Uh, we've got players back, and Sam Boldock was in the in the match day squad and, and and travelled with the team, so that that was nice to see him um, see him back available. He, he obviously didn't make the bench, but he'll be he'll be in and around it. Oh, sorry, he did make the bench, but he didn't get on the pitch and. Uh, he'll be in and around the team, I'm sure, in the in the coming weeks. And we finally have players that we can bring off that bench to affect the game if we need to. The fact that you know, you've got Billy Bowden, Josh Murphy, uh, Gorin can can come on as well if we need to see out a game. And Gorin really should have scored. He missed a he missed an absolute sitter in the in the second half. But I just feel for Exeter, they need to sort of um, sort out the manager situation. But for them, the real problem is this: they've got a very small squad and. It, They've got some injury problems all in the same sort of area of the pitch at the moment. And uh, they just, yeah, they look really tired um, and were unable, I think, to, to cope with Oxford, who uh, put in a really, really good performance. Yeah, the start of the season for Exeter means they're out of serious trouble at the moment. But you just wanted to pick up to them a bit. I don't know if there has been any talk about who the manager could be, James. I don't know if you've seen anything. No, I mean, there's, there was a talk of David Artel wasn't there and... and um, People like that, but I, I haven't actually seen anything that I would say is, is concrete evidence of who's going to take over. We'll have to wait and see. I don't see, um, you know, there's talk of it that being kept in house, but I think they will bring someone in. I think they'll bring someone in to, well, to sort yeah. of, yeah, move move this team forward. I mean, they just uh, they just lacked in the end the the energy and the and the sort of composure to to really press themselves on Oxford and despite scoring twice, um, I think Oxford could have gone up another gear if we'd had to in that second half. David, a surprise result at Portman Road, Ipswich Town nil, Lincoln City one. You say a surprise result, but I feel like we were seeing shades of this sort of result potentially appearing last week against Morecambe. Um, for me, this is this is sort of like there were definitely elements and shades of 
of last week's game in this one, um, where just, you know, Ipswich had sort of chance after chance and just couldn't take it. I mean, um, Lincoln, um, opening the scoring for the only goal of the game here from a Ben House header after I find a bit of head tennis. Hilarious, by the way. Just so much head tennis in the box. Like, yeah, how, how it's not cleared is, is beyond me, but, um, very theatrical diving header to, to put the ball in at the far post. But after that point, um, you know, Lincoln just dug in and completely just defended for their lives. Um, it just felt like an, almost like, you know, even watching the highlights here just felt almost like a old, old age castle siege. Um, like Ipswich finishing the 90 with just 70, like 76% possession and 33 shots and only five on target though. Right. Yeah. But the fact that there's, you know, to have that many shots, only five on target, but nothing to kind of show for that at the end. Um, I think to be honest, I think a result like this was coming. I, I think it was just, they were, they were quite fortunate. I think last week against Morecambe, um, but you know, Lincoln just digging right in here and it wasn't, the thing is, is it wasn't as if they were without chances either. You know, Lee Evans hitting the, hitting the woodwork from a free kick uh, a couple of other times where they probably should have scored. Um, but overall, just a very impressive defensive performance from Lincoln. Um, and to be fair, the, the most significant part about this is that's the first home defeat of this season for Ipswich. Yeah, first time Lincoln have beaten Ipswich at Ipswich in a league game since 1954 as well. I so, love those kind of stats. They're great ones. Yeah. Yeah, I look, I'd say I spend far too long looking them up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Again, for Lincoln... Good, good back three. They've changed their formation to this back three in the last few games, and it's, it seems to be working. Paulie O'Connor, Adam Jackson, and, and Regan Paul look very solid. Um, it's good to see Jackson back fit because I think he's a good player for them. Matty Virtue's been a great signing in the midfield. Sanders alongside him in this, and and allowing Aomo and Sean Routland, who, who you know didn't start the season as the favoured player on the left. It was Robson, but he's come in and he's made that place his own. A good young player. Through the uh, through the academy there, I think it was for for Lincoln. But you know he's he's knocked on the door a few times in the last couple of seasons, and good to see him get that um, that sort of sustainable run in the first team. Absolutely, we'll keep things running. James Richards, talk to me about Wickham Wanderers three, Peterborough United one. Yeah, Peterborough do not like playing at Adams Park. Uh, they've not won a league game here since two thousand and three. They actually play quite well, in fairness. It, it, you know, this game, I think the scoreline, I'd say it flatters Wickham. Um, their third goal, you've got to remember, was scored with uh, with the goalkeeper coming up for a corner and they broke away after a rather poor passing decision was made by, I think it was Fuchs in the midfield, gives it away and allows Wickham to break to score the, the third. But Posh had their chances and, uh, you, you know, they might feel a bit aggrieved that they didn't take them. You've got to remember they're missing Kwame Poku and Jack Taylor. Ricky J. Jones also limped out of this game. Um, and at, at one nil, when they'd taken the lead for a wonderful Harrison Burrow strike, who's been he's been moved from left back to, to midfield in the last few games, and he struck a, a thunderbolt to give them the lead. Uh, and then Joel Randall had a really good opportunity to double that lead uh, when it was at one nil, and he kind of just he just hooked his shot a tiny bit, and it, it hit the outside of the post and went wide. And then Wickham did a did a Wickham, and they're a great side at being resilient, and they can come back. Sam Vokes is a massive player for them. When he's not playing, they don't really have that outlook for their more direct style. And, uh, you know, the, the first goal was three headers, McCarthy to Vokes to flick on for, for McCleary to head in. And that's a, not being unfair to Wickham, but that is a very Wickham goal and it, and it works for them. And then Vokes got the second as well, um, uh, before Methnady, uh, rounded it up and he's had a, a really good season. But I think Peter will, Peter will feel disappointed because they didn't play badly. Uh, but they just couldn't cope, I think, defensively with some of the physicality that Wickham exerted. And then, of course, the last goal when they're chasing the game adds a, a little bit of gloss to the scoreline. But you no, know, I think Wickham in, in Alfie Mawson have a wonderful centre-back. Um, going back to a team you played for before doesn't always work, but this this looks like it's working out just fine. And and a big shout-out, I think, to uh, Chris Farina, who's been maybe shout-out maybe a shout for their play of the season for him because he has been so solid. He was excellent against Oxford um, and, and Wickham back to being what we expect them to be. And I, I wouldn't be surprised to see them sort of move on up the table for a, and get on a good run from now on. Yeah, I, I think to be honest, Wickham's player of the season will be Anis Mometi with the output he has. But definitely Chris Torino, I think a bit yeah, like Mometi was one are, of those brought, right, in, yeah. brought into their development, their B team, wasn't it, to progress up. And he's, he's one alongside he's Mometi who's been, so been rewarded. 
Yeah, he's been very, very, very good. I mean, Wickham have got um, now they've got. I mean, Brandon Hanlon made it, um, a, a brief appearance at the end, and that's his first appearance of the season. So they've got some players coming back. Um, you know, and if you remember a few weeks ago, they looked really short of numbers. So it makes a massive difference. It really does. It does, and that's a great win over Peter Preside, who I think they met for the first time since that uh, that whole PPG debacle, and apparently people still aren't over it. So no, it's still called the points per game derby, isn't it? Or something? Oh, something silly. I think someone will make a joke about 1.74 again. Some some day they'll let it go. Some some day <laughs> they'll let it go. James Beck, Cambridge United nil, Sheffield Wednesday two. Yeah, so looking in on that game, you'd, you'd probably expect the result to to be what it was. Um, it's now four defeats in in four for Cambridge, and slightly worrying. Um, sort of five minutes in, and a big ball behind from from Liam Palmer, and Lee Gregory finished really coolly, as you'd expect from him in this in this division. Um, he's not been great so far. He's he's been involved in every game, and he's he's not sort of scored anywhere near the amount of goals you'd expect um, with the players behind him creating the chances that they do. Um, but yeah, Sheffield Wednesday did exactly what they needed to do. Um, Darren Moore, when he spoke after the game, was very straight to the point, saying it was three points and we move on. Uh, Cambridge had a lot of the ball, but but didn't really do a great deal with it, and they really lacked creativity. Um, I heard uh, after the game as well from BBC Cambridge that apparently Paul Digby might be out for a spell, and that that is massive mm-hmm. because. He's such a good midfielder, but doesn't really get much of a mention from outside of Cambridge. You know, the fans know how good he is, but he is an engine in the midfield. And when he's not there, they, they really miss him. And so I do worry yeah, about that. I know it's Lewis, Lewis Simper was in midfield as well alongside him because Adam May wasn't around and Liam O'Neill the same. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I heard, I did hear someone mention that Simper might have got a knock as well in this. So, you know, they're, with Adam May not there and, and Digby now potentially out for a while, they, they do lack... Um, they do lack a bit in midfield because I don't know where Liam O'Neill was. I assume he was injured as well because his his injury record's been um, awful over the years, frankly. Yeah, Digby's one of them players, isn't he? That sort of goes unnoticed because he's he's not particularly high on goals and assists, um, but he's pivotal to everything they do. Yeah, he's um, a very important player. The second half was sort of similar pattern. Um, Cambridge again having a lot of a lot of the ball, but any sort of real chances came the way of Sheffield Wednesday. Um, and again, another ball in from Palmer and Gregory's sort of swirling effort went in at the near post. And I think the goalkeeper potentially could have done better with it. Um, it you know, you never want to get beaten at the near post. But it was, I think it was, there was some sort of deflection on it, which, which spun the ball. So it was a bit of a difficult one. Um, but one thing that I think sort of might be <laughs> hampering Cambridge, uh, Cambridge is, is the fact that Mark Bonner's name seems to be floating about for every vacant manager's role. <laughs> yeah. Um, and <laughs> he, they could really just do with him doing the job that he's done so well for them for, for so long now. They could uh, do with Har- Harrison Dunk being back as well, I think. I mean, he's su- he's been such a key player for them over the last few seasons that they're not a squad that when they lose players can really adapt. They went for three at the back, which yeah. I don't necessarily think suits them. George Williams plays the right centre-back. Greg Taylor, who I think, is he still League One level? Um, I'm not sure he is. Greg Taylor's you know. been at Cambridge for about a thousand years, hasn't he? I'm <laughs> convinced he... I'm, I'm, I remember looking through, just randomly one day, the conference playoff finals, and Greg Taylor was in the Cambridge team that went up. Didn't he open the Cambridge University back in he the last century? He could well be. Form? He's been at Cambridge for <laughs> however long Cambridge has existed, really, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. So, uh, sort of as expected as well, um, Barry Bannon absolutely runs the show every week, doesn't he? Um, I, I really think it's a championship squad and they just seem to have depth in every position, which is, you know, what every manager wants. I think Mourinho once said that you need to have two players in every position and in some positions, Sheffield Wednesday have got three. Yeah, we, uh, do, we do our classic with Sheffield Wednesday, which is run through the bench, don't we, James? And it's it's Jaden Brown, George <laughs> okay. Byers, Cameron Dawson, Fisero Deli Bashiro, Mark McGuinness, Alex Martin, Callum Patterson. Yeah, and uh, I've <laughs> also known as cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, you know, that, that team had obviously, the, the, them players would get into any of the other teams in the league, wouldn't they? So, yeah. It's, um, yeah, Cambridge. Uh, four defeats in four, but 
like you said, with, with all the injuries, it's not. They have too... also had three of those defeats. I should add to the Sheffield Wednesday derby in Ipswich. Yeah, it's exactly. the Bristol Rovers one that you look at. It's probably the most disappointing out of the four. Yeah, um, and Mark Bonner alluded to it in his his, his post match conference that they tried something completely different today um, with the three four one two, and you know it clearly didn't work. But it was it was good to see, obviously on the back of three defeats, trying to change something up and, and, and try and get a result. Obviously, it didn't work, but yeah, I, I'm not too worried about Cambridge. I think that, you know, they'll probably end up in sort of lower mid-table, but but that'll be absolutely fine for for the, you know, the, the budget they have and, and the team that they are. A result in Staffordshire, Port Vale 2, Forest Green Rovers 2. A mixture of relief and frustration from Port Vale manager Daryl Clark. For this, he felt his side were the strongest team throughout but were left reeling by a pair of first-half set pieces that Port Vale just didn't deal with. The first was a, a Miles Pert Harris header from a Harry Boys free kick off the right. It's great to see Boys back in the starting 11 for Thoris Green, by the way, because yeah. he's barely featured all season. I think he made the bench in midweek for their defeat to Peterborough and has got into the starting 11 here. He's going to be crucial up the left-hand side for them. Thoris Green's second goal from Bailey Cargill off the Corio Keith delivery and they're 2-0 up heading into half-time. Clark certainly had a lot of praise, though, for the retained belief that that Vale Park crowd had in the team and the impact of the players he brought on from the bench. He refers to them as game changers because he doesn't like using the term subs to describe the players brought on. And one of them certainly was a game changer in Mipo Odebeko, who is on loan from West Ham United up top, brought on to the front line, got a goal in the 78th minute. It got the whole Port Vale team going again and they would find their equaliser 10 minutes later from the penalty spot. Vale have waited nearly 80 games for a penalty in a match and they've now had three in the last two matches. It's crazy. Yeah. Well worth the wait for them. Ellis, yeah, Ellis Harrison scored this one. Um, and if it wasn't for a top Luke McGee save late on, Ellis Harrison could well have won the Paul Vale game as well. It was a great save from McGee right at the end. Definite frustration, I'm sure, from Thoris Green to throw away a good advantage and lose two points that would have put them right on the edge of safety. But a testament to the character that is in place within this Port Vale squad. So they are 16th right now on 16 points of Vale. Finished season at position, and it is a very successful one. They keep getting the required points to stay out of serious trouble, James. It's it's impressive to prevail at the moment. It is, yeah. They've just got to keep going like that and make sure... I mean, th- let's be honest, this season is about staying up and consolidating their place in League yeah. One and that's all they've got to keep doing. Yeah, and I like that front lock pairing, Ellis Harrison, Jez Wilson. Well, it's, really it's looking Harrison's good. Harrison's been a great signing. They complement each other well, those two, for sure. They do, absolutely. Three more results to run through. Fleetwood Town nil, Shrewsbury Town 1. The goal from Tom Bay is a great strike from the edge of the box. There was a good chance as well to Carlos Mendes Gomez to Fleetwood to grab an equaliser. He rounded the goalkeeper, but had the shot cleared off the line by Taylor Moore. Shrewsbury had their physio, Dan Green, sent off in the 91st minute here. I can't work out what for. I've been trying to find out, but I don't know. I really liked one of the comments underneath the red card tweet, though, that described him as getting the tragic sponge. <laughs> that is a superb reply from you, sir. Absolutely love that. That, that was yeah, great. While we're, while we're on Shrewsbury Town, I also like to send my love to Glyn Price, who's the, uh, the host of uh, Salopcast, who's been diagnosed with incurable bowel cancer, and he's only 42. I mean, the guy's brilliant. Such a nice guy. Such a, a wonderful um, reporter on Shrewsbury over the years and just sending, you know, if he's listening, all, all my love to him and his family at this awful time. Yeah, we absolutely wish you all the best for sure. Burton Albion won, Morecambe won. Uh, I have no idea how Liam Shaw has got away with that tackle on Terry Taylor, especially uh-huh. when you see the tackle that earned Ben Fox a red card to Northampton Town that we'll get onto in the League Two section as well. But Davis Keeler Dunn got the open with the Burton Albion. Ryan Delaney equalised the Morecambe with a crack of the range and they're an expected source for an equaliser. Not really the ideal result for either side, really. It was 23rd v 24th, and they've ended up staying in the exact same places, but with a point both extra. And the only goal is draw yesterday. Bolton Wanderers nil, Barnsley nil, the final result to mention from League One. We'll run through the League One table to finish. Plymouth Argyle still lead the way. They're on 34 points from 14. There is now a four-point gap between them and Ipswich Town, who have 30 points from the same number of games. Sheffield Wednesday after they went up to 29 from 14. Portsmouth, they play on Monday against Charlton at the Valley. That's going to be a very fun game, by the way. Keep an eye on that for sure. They're on 22 points, having played 11. They've got a lot of games at hand on those around them still at the moment. Peterborough on 22 from 14. Barnsley wrap up the player spots on 21 from 13. Bolton on the same points, but outside by just goal difference. And you also have Shrewsbury up there as well and Derby up there as well to complete an exciting top nine at the moment. Morecambe still bottom of the table, eight points from 13 games after their draw. Burton now in 23rd, still at nine points from 14. Milton Keynes dons after another really poor defeat, 10 points from 13. And Forest Green Rovers wrap up the relegation zone with 12 points from 14 games. 
Cheltenham Town, Oxford United just above on 14 points each. Let's drop down and take a look at the world's best fourth tier. James Beck, we're going to start with you and we're going to begin with the Friday night game between Tranmere Rovers and Crew Alexandra. I just want to stay before we start. This Friday night football idea that Tranmere Rovers have is something they've done for a number of years and I think it's such a good idea because it completely it gives them a chance to just put football matches on when nothing else in Merseyside area is going on. So you have this interest from other people in the Merseyside area, whether that might be Liverpool fans or Everton fans, for instance, who get this chance to go and watch Tranmere on Prenton Park on a Friday night with nothing else around and take an interest in it. And certainly, James, if they were part of the home crowd yesterday, or Friday, sorry, they would have absolutely loved it because Tranmere Rovers beat Crew Alexandra by three goals to nil. Yeah, they can They can all... Um, they. they, they... There was a fair amount of the Tranmere fans yesterday, actually. Uh, yesterday. Over 8,000 in the crowd, I think. Over. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of crew fans as well. I think probably near 900, maybe even 1,000. Um, so going into it, it was perfect Friday night under the lights. You know, Tranmere is easily accessible for, for away fans. It's, it's a, you know, a nice ground to go to, sort of old fashioned, and the noise gets kept in. Um, but, but yeah, the Tranmere fans can definitely go away happy. Crew fans on the other on the other hand really really can't. Um, so sort of early in the first half there wasn't much in it until the goal. It was quite a bitty game. It, it wasn't you know there was no real class. Um, but 22 minutes in and a, a low corner really not dealt with by the crew defence gave a tap in for for Daniel Simu. Um, and it was a really poor goal to concede it. It, 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 throughout the game, second balls were always won by Tranmere. Um, they just really wanted it more, and you, you can you can see why they they they'd won the previous four. To be honest with you, their their back four looked excellent, and, and Jordan Turner James, I so, might so compare that back four to the Melanti with the nineties. <laughs> I know you, I know you like that comparison. <laughs> I know you like Italian football. Uh, yeah, yeah, Daniel yeah. Simu is, is absolutely fantastic. He was brilliant all game. Really, really good. So calm on the ball. I thought, you know, Courtney Baker Richardson usually gives defenders a nightmare um, with his with his power and his his size. Um, but yeah, he he didn't have a look in really. He had a couple of half chances in at the start of the second half. Um, but <laughs> I think he'll probably be disappointed with both of them. To be honest, um, he, he had a a low bouncing shot which he he, he should have put across the keeper. It, it went wide. Um, and then a header that he, he really didn't get enough power on, um, but they were they were the best chances for Crew and Baker Richardson again feeding off scraps. Um, there's there's no creativity at all, and it's yeah it's I think it's one win in eight now, and it's it's really not great. <laughs> Joel Tabernier playing at right wing for Crew yesterday. Yeah, another another one off the off the academy. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many that have came through at Crew, and that is always what they're going to be, um, a team that brings through these young talents. And he was probably one of the brighter players. He, he wants to move forward. He's, he's got that technical ability that a lot of them haven't, where he's able to sort of move on the turn and, and go at defenders. I think he'll be, he'll end up being a very, very good player and, um, you'll definitely be hearing his name more this season. I would uh, hope so, but the Tranmere, five wins in a row, all of them to nil. Absolutely ridiculously solid back line. The fourth or two they play here, they lost Paul Lewis to an injury, which meant Elliot Nevin had to come on. And I mean, that's yeah. not a problem because Nevin yeah. and Hemmings up top is a great partnership. And it's that it's that central four for me I think I love so much about Tranmere. Dino Samir and John Turnbull at the base of defence. Leo Connor and Chris Merry in midfield. It just lets the fullbacks and the wingers go and be so expressive. And Tranmere right now looks sensational. They've got to be watched. Yeah. So it, the um, going back to the the reason Lewis had to to come off injured in the I think it was just sort of thirty minutes in. So it was a ball in behind and it, he was offside and he carried on and he took a shot and I think he pulled his hamstring taken, oh. which was great for the away fans. That was that was actually probably the best um, best part of play that they that we saw all night really. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Going back to the, the fullbacks at Tranmere, I really like Josh Cogley. Um, I think he's absolutely brilliant and a really good partnership with Morris down the right, which gave Rio Adebisi nightmares, and I'm sure he's still thinking about it now. 
I know um, England are complaining about a right back crisis with injuries at the World Cup. Well, I'm sorry, Dacus Cogley's fine. So <laughs> yeah, go, go, and, uh, go and do it. He's a player that I think will probably probably end up sort of moving up the leagues. Um, he's, he looks really really solid for for Tranmere, and yeah, they well deserved of the win, but. They they didn't really have to get out of second gear. Um, to be honest with you, it was it was an awful awful watch for for, for the crew fans, um, and I'd, I'd imagine a couple of them will think twice before before going to an away game again. Um, but but yeah, it was a uh, one winning eight for crew. Alex Morris sort of making quite a lot of the same excuses week in week out, um, and. Crew fans are starting to, to get a bit tired with that and they weren't happy that it was an internal appointment again anyway. There was no interview process at all. So, yeah, it's uh, it's not looking great for crew at the moment and sliding down the table. Yeah, I'm sure it's not comfortable for crew at the moment. JR, another 3-0 victory. Carlisle United 3, Doncaster Rovers 0. Yeah, Paul Simpson's a wizard. I mean, he he really is. What he's getting out of this team is un- unbelievable. Nine unbeaten for the first time since uh, the start of the 2016-17 season when Keith Curl got them on that mad 15-game unbeaten run to kick kickstart that campaign. There's your target. John yeah, John Mellish had a you know John Mellish had a great game. Um, I thought he he was uh, really strong. Um, created a couple of goals by just being on the front foot, and being. Really aware of, of, of the spaces that he had to cover. I thought he was excellent. Owen Moxon's been superb this season for them. No, we can't. We're not allowed to say that name. Oh, we're not. Okay. Uh, he so, shall not be named. Is what we're uh, he shall. He who shall not be named. That's who correct, came from yes. Annan Athletic. Um, after, <laughs> yes, that's what we call him. After Peter Murphy gave Paul Simpson a call about this lad he had there. Um, you know, he's just come in and he's been absolutely amazing. And him in midfield with Callum Guy. Um, it's 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 a lovely pair to have. Cam Guy obviously being set up by him who must not be named um, for the first goal. He struck it low right into the bottom corner, and uh, and they didn't really look back. I think uh, you have to give massive credit to Jack Stratton for the energy and and the effort that he puts in week in week out, and finally got his goal. Uh, I was very impressed with Jack Ellis coming in as a uh, replacement. Yeah, for special Thinback. mention to him because Thinback was unavailable through injury as well, and adds to another big injury list to Carlisle. But the way they're going at the minute, when that injury list, if it does somehow die down and get one back, my word, James, they could be magnificent this year. Well, we all were not sure what to expect from Carlisle. We were pretty down on them. I think we had them down in 18th, and um, I'm just delighted that they're making us look silly because I love Paul Simpson. Um, I probably haven't mentioned it before, but he played for Oxford back in the 90s and did quite well. <laughs> Um, but he's you know, he's very hard on Jordan Gibson, admittedly himself. But he gets the best out of him. He's back to his best now. He's playing superb football. Um, he's creative. He's direct with his running. He probably should have scored in this game. Uh, they had a penalty that they missed as well. You know, Carlisle were all over. Yeah, they they were all over him. They were all over him. They 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 could have scored more goals. It could have been a lot worse for um, for Doncaster, who I think looked just abject you know the confidence is shot their performance lacked the performance lacked energy um and to think that Doncaster appointed McSheffrey over Paul Simpson because McSheffrey was the more enthusiastic apparently that that was the the line at the time uh, but it's five defeats and eight now and and I can't see how they get better because that was their best 11 on the pitch Doncaster and yet they were second best to everything um against a, a Carlisle side who were just really good to watch yeah, disappointed with Doncaster throughout the season. I mean, they've, they've had patches. They started very well. They had a decent little patch again, but I think the pressure's back on McShester again. They've just got to be so much better. Fans, fans were singing for his his, uh, his sacking at the game. and mm, I'm not surprised. You know, there, there's a lot of angry fans online as well. Well, another great win for Carlisle United, though. Um, Carlisle Trammer is the 29th of October, by the way. Save that for your diaries. That's going to be... Probably a nil nil, but it's going to be a good. It's going to. It's two very good teams at the minute. That'll be a lot of fun to watch, certainly. Uh, another win. Stockport County one, Grimsby Town three. I want to start by giving a quick live score update to you guys. It is currently Stockport County red cards five. Stockport County wins four. They've fallen behind again. They've fallen behind <laughs> again. That is after another red card today given to Callum Camps after an aggressive tackle that led to a straight red. Grimsby, by this point, were already 2-1 ahead. They got into leave with a pair of back post goals from Harry Clifton and Gavin Hollihan. Uh, Paddy Madden had pounced to grab one back before our time. Third consecutive game he scored into that as it's nice little personal form for him, but for his team, 
absolutely anything but at the moment for them. Grimsby would seal the win on the break in the second half stoppage time against 10 men. Anthony Dis- Dr- I can't even say his name. Anthony Driscoll Glennon from the left, feeding the ball to midfielder Alex Hunt, who scored and sparked great scenes in that open away end at Edgeley Park, which was packed with Grimsby fans. They really enjoyed this trip. These were the two sides promoted from the National League last season. It is abundantly clear that Grimsby are far better set for this League 2 season. Stockport are doing just about enough to stay clear of the relegation zone to be honest right now i should add there are three points currently between 16th place stockport and 24th place hartlepool it is very uncomfortable down there at the moment and please do not clip that out of context anyone who's listening <laughs> don't you dare a lot of positives to say about grimsby so far and i imagine there'll be plenty more to come i really like their midfield options once everyone's back fully fit as well they haven't got everyone available yet. i think Bryn morris is still yet to return but when that's available that's a nice collection to have in there they're right in with the playoff chases and going very well after back-to-back wins over sides who just simply aren't the same level as them Grimsby look very good now they could do a lot more than just survive this year keep an eye on them for sure James Richards Crawley Town 2 Newport County 1 plenty both on and off the pitch for these two sides this week yeah Kevin Betsy gone James Rovery gone Darren Kelly in at Newport uh not sure about that one but uh Lewis Young is a great uh sort of interim appointment because He's Mr. Crawley. He knows the club well. He knows the players. And he did exactly what he should have done, which is gone back to basics, put the round pegs back in the round holes. And lo and behold, it worked. Crawley looked much, much better. Franken was back in the team as a captain and they've needed his voice, I think. Uh, I don't really know what Joe Day was doing for the first goal. Um, just a terrible, terrible mis- mistake to, to gift Crawley the lead. James Tilly still had to to do well, but I think Tom Fellows deserves a shout out for Crawley. He was excellent all game long. Very unlucky not to score uh, with that run, that sort of dribble he did in from the left, right across the 18 yard box and then shot wide. If that gone in, potentially goal of the season candidate. It was really good play from him. He was excellent on that left hand side. Hessenthaler and Powell back doing what they were very well known for last season, being really robust in the centre of midfield. Um, and they had like, they had a right back playing right back for a change. You know, they had, uh, Robson in goal was actually quite good. I'm he, glad he they made that off. switch as well because I've not thought much of Calvary Dye at all. I'm glad no, Robson's no. got a chance. Oh, well, he made that great save from the free kick mm. and he was commanding in the second half, did everything he had to do. Um, you know, Saruda did had a good game. Craig and Conroy, very experienced centre backs at this level, were, were were really solid. Nichols and Nadson up front. Nadson obviously scoring the second goal uh, to give him uh, the clear advantage before a really, really uh, wonderful strike by Nathan Murray Welsh to pull a goal back and they did throw everything at it in the end, but um, just bodies on the line for Crawley and, and a bit of determination saw them, saw them through. And I think I I'm, I'm completely agree with Kevin Betsy sacking. I thought he was um, just out of his depth. He just wasn't getting a tune out of the team and it, it just wasn't working a little bit more surprised about James Robry. I thought he's, he's the victim of the cruel world of football results. Ultimately this, this stands back, not just to this season, but to last season as well. I think, Prior to when his sacking was announced, they'd lost eight of their 13 league games a season, a single home league win since the 5th of March. And it's yeah, just not I, enough for a club that we've seen under Michael Flynn James come very close to getting to League One the last two seasons. It's just not enough for them, sadly. And as much as I love him as a person and as a coach, it just hasn't worked, sadly, for him. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think they're a victim of, of Michael Flynn's success in some respects still, because not Newport County, for facilities, crowds and everything that they have budget-wise are a League Two team. So for them to be really pushing with some of the bigger sides at this level, uh, which they were under Mike Flynn for you know, pretty much every season he was there, was a testament to what he was doing. And I think it's very difficult for anyone to come in and replicate that with you know with the loss of talent that they, they've got. You know, Finn Azaz no longer there. Ollie Cooper was excellent. He's gone. Dom Telford gone. Courtney Baker Richardson gone. It's not easy to replace those players. And, uh, Perhaps, and I think but that's a... starting 11 yesterday. I like. I think that can be better than 19th, absolutely. And much like, oh, yeah. I, I much think like with Crawley, to, yeah. I looked at both Crawley and Newport squads and thought, you can be so much better than the position you find yourselves in currently. Well, I think they will ultimately be once they get good managers in. I'm fascinated think, who Crawley go I for, think, by yeah. the way. Oh, God. It better Absolutely not, yeah. fascinated yeah. by who they're going to go for. I'm just worried it'll be some big-name ex-footballer who's got no experience. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if it was someone like Sol Campbell. Oh, God. Oh, I'm wondering <laughs> if Jimmy thought that's a bank fancy is another gig. Yeah. Good grief. We'll see with them. That is a great win. I'm really pleased for Lewis Young and I'm really pleased for the Crawley fans as well because they've had it hard. But a very simple formation yesterday. Sometimes you just don't need to complicate football as much as people he, do. He just said, I went back to what we all played as kids. Yep. That's what Lewis Young said yep. and it worked. 
It did, and it's a great win for them. David, another big win for a team down the bottom. Harrogate Town 2, Hartlepool United 1. Yeah, really big win and, and much needed for Harrogate, really. I mean, overall in this one, a pretty, pretty even game, to be fair. But um, if, if you're going by statistics, but as we know, you know, you can't always rely on those little nuggets. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for Harrogate, you know, they hadn't won at home since the opening game of the season when they beat Swindon 3-0. Um, and I'm sure Simon Weaver especially will be quite happy about that. Um, cause if they'd lost this game, he would have equaled his longest winless run, uh, during his tenure as Harrogate manager, which I believe was back in 2011. But yourself or James might be able to shed some more light I on that. I don't know the full inside history of Harrogate Town, to be honest. No, but I mean, he's been, he's, he is Mr. Harrogate and he's been there for, for years. But I agree with you. Massive, massive result for them. A lot of Hartlepool fans are very sort of down on their chances of getting out of this, just lack of quality in the squad, really. I think that I think they did all right yesterday, though. To be fair, um, Har- um, Alex Patterson converting from close range, opening the scoring, um, just uh, straight across Kellip's goal, um, bottom bottom left corner, um, Harrogate um, scoring the second just before half time, Jack Muldoon scoring his first goal since that opening day uh, game against Swindon Town, um, Hartlepool pulling one back five minutes from time, cheeky little chip from Imara, but. Um, you know, it, it was made pretty obvious that that was his only choice when Jameson comes rushing out how he did. Um, but yeah, good, good three points overall for Harrogate, really. Um, and a much needed win. Um, you know, f- they were on a three game losing streak at that point. Um, you know, first, first win at home since the start of the season. Um, hopefully signs of more positive things to come for them. Yeah. And I'm sure you're, you're delighted, David, with us being able to say that the last win was no longer against Gillingham. Absolutely it's delighted, weird with my friend. I, I got to talk with a Harrogate fan during the week, and it's weird because you look at the other clubs down the bottom, they will change manager if needs be, but the situation at Harrogate with Irving Wiener, Simon's dad being the chairman, it's just, it, it's so unlikely for anything to really change there before anything to get really drastically bad before anything like that. Wouldn't it be really awkward when it happened as well? And I think that's part of the reason I felt so concerned about Harrogate, really, is that you didn't trust that change of manager to come maybe as much. They need to invest in their squad in January because the money is there for Harrogate Town. I've been told about it. They just need to improve on what they have at the moment. But that's a win that will help them. As the Hartlepool, yeah, not good at all. They're back on the bottom of the table after results elsewhere as well. Theo Robinson started up top. Um, I mean, we've, we've had good things about to say about Theo Robinson in the past. His last two clubs have not really put a lot of light onto him. I want to talk about Chris Maguire as well, who was... A pretty high caliber signing when he arrived. He's not even registered yet. There's an underlying issue around um, breaches of betting rules, I think it is, that basically means yeah. the PFA and the EFL have rejected his contract. So he's not officially a Hartlepool player yet. He might never be a Hartlepool player the way it's going. You well, just it's can't rely on him. Yeah, and he's injured as well. When they, yeah, when they signed him, I thought, how can they sign him when he's got this charge hanging over him? But there you go. It's not great for Hartlepool, but that is a very, very big result for Harrogate Town, certainly. James Beck, Rochdale 2, Barrow 1, another big result down the bottom of the table. Yeah, a first home win as well for Rochdale, um, who played really well yesterday. Um, Sort of 18 minutes in and a a throw in came to Liam Kelly, who gained a yard of space and curled a lovely shot in from the edge of the box. It was a great finish. Um, Ex-Oxford Liam Kelly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> just doesn't stop does he nothing ever does <laughs> there must be a reason he's uh, he's played at League 2 now then but it was certainly a, a finish capable of, of League 1 uh, that's for sure um, and throughout the game they, they looked really really good on the break Rochdale um, obviously the the three at the back formation with, with Ado and, and Devante Rodney out wide um, really sort of works well Um and yeah, they, they stretched them all game and sort of in the second half, sort of similar pattern. Barrow did have more of the ball, but really didn't create a great deal with it. Um, they had a couple of half chances, um, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't the Barrow that we saw at the start of the season, um, by, by a long stretch and, and sort of 15 minutes to go in the second half, Rochdale got another goal through across from Devante Rodney um, across the six-yard box for Scott Quigley, who, you know, he really doesn't miss those, and and, and Rochdale were two 0 up, um, and probably deserving of of being two 0 up. To be honest, it was a really good performance, and and they'll obviously be really really happy to to get that first home win of the season, um, sort of 
last couple of minutes, Niall Canavan scored from from a corner, um, which meant it was nervy last couple of minutes for Rochdale, but they held on and, and got that elusive first home win of the season. Yeah, it's very much a case of coming back down to earth, really, for the Barra after such a sensational start. I think you have to be honest and say they were riding their luck at the beginning. There was... It was more about what they were doing out of possession and in transition that was really helping them to pick up those results at the start of the season. And four consecutive league defeats now has really knocked them back down the table a little bit into an area that I'm probably more expecting to be. Let's not be clear. I mean, the position they're in now is sensational when you think about the difficult seasons they've had since coming up into the Football League. I, I love them under Pete Wilde, and I think they will do very well in the long term, certainly. Rochdale, yeah. again, I've, I've spoken about before. I like his thought of 3-1. I'm glad Ethan E. Banks Landell's back in the team as well. He, he played in midweek during, I think it was their Ethel Trophy game as well. He's back into the back line as well to partner Sam Graham. They look good. They look good, Rochdale. They look better than the teams down the bottom, and that's positive. And Jim Bentley's had a good impact on him so far. Yeah, well, it was interesting to see and, and sort of nice honesty from Pete Wilde in his, his post-match interview. And he completely agreed that Rochdale were the better team. Um, and obviously it takes a lot for a manager to do that. Um, but he, he was completely right. Rochdale deserved it of the, of the win. And they hopefully used these last two wins to sort of have a platform now and, and keep kicking on. Takes them out the bottom two as well. Very positive for them. Up to 11 points from 13. Very good for Rochdale. David, another 2-1 home win. West still Town 2, Walsall 1. Yeah, um, the Stags coming into this game on a six-game unbeaten run. Um, with this win keeping their 100% home record alive for this season, which um, I'm not sure James unbeaten. will probably have. Unbeaten. There you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, James will probably have some sort of stats somewhere that will tell you how many teams are still in the AFL have that. But I don't know if he has it to hand right now. But I will um, not be able to tell you... Uh, I think there's not there's not many teams there's I think only Stevenage is it and uh, Argyle at home Argyle who have got the hundred percent home records um, in terms of unbeaten at home let's have a look I think there is about three teams I think it's Mansfield Carlisle and Stevenage who are the only teams in League Two yet to lose at home this season. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an impressive little group that. Um, so yeah, um, the Stags opening the scoring, um, when Stephen Quinn was set up George, George Lapsley, um, who makes a really nice slick turn, um, like basically just a full 180 and just tucks it into the bottom left of the corner. Keeper has no chance really. Um, that's five goals for him so far, uh, this season. Um, Walsall equalizing 35 minutes in, um, like, Arguably one of the goals of the day for me, um, an absolute piercing ball uh, straight through the stag defence to set up Bennett for a shot, um, and he just places it into well, just right goal, as, yeah. yeah, just powers. I don't it think into he places it; he just fires it. No, past just, him, doesn't he? Yeah, just powers it into the roof of the net, really, doesn't he? Um, and then uh, you know it would be a while before there was any sort of breakthrough from either team that uh, Mansfield would then go on to find the winner eight minutes from time. Um, Old Burton lad, Ed, uh, Lucas Aitkins cross uh, would set up Will Swan to head past Owen Evans for the three points for, for Mansfield. I saw him do a left-footed cross. I'm trying to think. <laughs> there were so many goals, great, but I, great left-footed great cross, crosses, I can't think of many. Be good. He's normally on the end of them, to be honest. Which is quite uh, good. Nice to see him get an assist, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And no DJ, of course, for Walsall, because he's against his parent club, so they do miss, miss his goals, I think, when he's not playing. They're a bit like Carlisle, really. They've got a massive injury list as well, Walsall. But unlike Carlisle, this one's actually really hurting them. They just, it's, just, yeah. it's disappointing to Walsall, really. They're still a long way off where I hope they could be this season. But man, still still going strong. Um, I was expecting, a, I think it was the exact same eleven as the team that played Barrow the week before. And uh, I think Cloth was indicating there might be one or two absentees. So he's, he's managed to pull through with the assessments that he had. The injuries as well to play the team, but I, I like this three-five-one-one that they're going. The same formation that we're seeing Paul Wongo with Derby County as well. Really good formation, but I think I said to you in the past, James, that uh, it's, there's every chance of the month down the line, Cloth might have gone something different if the form dries up a bit. But for now, yeah, he does. He does change. He does, doesn't he? He does like so, chopping and changing. But for now, this is going really, really well for them, and they're up to fourth, right on the edge of the automatic places as well after a two-one win over Walsall. James Richards, AC Wimbledon nil, Sutton United one, a South London derby. Yeah, and the first away win of the season, finally, for Sutton, um, who I think were the better team and deserved this. And the, and the fact that they're doing this with like the crisis of injuries in their back line is so impressive. Because apart from Kobe Rowe, they don't really have any fit centre-backs today with Lewis John and, and Goodliff both out injured. Um, they had Joe Kizzy playing centre-back. They had Enzio Baldwin playing right-back. 
And it was just an all round great team performance where they dug in when they needed to because FC Wimbledon did create a few good opportunities. FC Wimbledon, I'm a bit worried about this. They're a young side. They're a side that don't really always impose themselves. And, uh, and Sutton should probably have scored more goals in this one if it wasn't for a couple of fantastic saves by the FC Wimbledon goalkeeper. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm just relieved for, for Sutton to get the, the away win finally. They've had a, a tough, a tough season with, with regards to players missing. They've got a, a pretty small squad, but Zanev made, you know, made a couple of stops, which you could have been forgiven for thinking it wasn't going to be their day again. But I don't know what you guys think of the goal that was scored uh, to I win know it. Joe I know Jackson I, wasn't very happy about it. It, look, it, it's very difficult. We get one camera angle, but from the camera angle, it looked like a Wimbledon player went into the goalkeeper, but whether or not he was pushed into the goalkeeper is another thing. Um, it's, it, it wasn't clear cut and, uh, and I think Sutton are due probably a little bit of luck. I mean, I do, I do like the fact that, uh, Davidson and Asal are such good players and, and really they'll create chances and, and they'll score goals in games, but they're on a really difficult sort of run of form where they're just in and out, no consistency. Um, and not looking like they can impose themselves at times. I think Curry and uh, Ogundiri were, were drafted in as the sort of the wing backs, both extremely young players without much experience. And I thought they did uh, a pretty good job. Uh, but you know, when Wimbledon have, have Jason Pierce playing or, or, or Lee Brown, they're going to have Alex to. Pierce. Sorry, Alex Pierce. Yeah, um, and uh, and Lee Brown, they're going to have to. They're going to have to sort of rely on these young players, and it can be quite difficult against uh, wily sides like Sutton who. Are very physical, uh, know their know their jobs quite well, and I thought Donovan Wilson had a, a really good game um, up front. He put in a, a lot of effort and probably feels he, he should have had a goal in this one. But yeah, well done to Matt Grayside for picking up all three points. Yeah, um, first game back for Jonathan Wilson after three games out of suspension. Paris Montgomery back into the Wimbledon midfield as well. I think Jackson's seeing the pressure a bit at the moment. They're not I, going can, great. Yeah, I. I could tell he looked a bit frustrated by it all on the on the yeah, ITV highlights just when he was well. asked about it. Yeah, David Salford City nil, Bradford City one. Yeah, uh, Bradford securing their fourth win in a row. Um, that comes for the first time since 1985. Um, thought um, I'd chuck one of those stats in there. Uh, do a little James. Um, <laughs> Where do you guys also, find these stats? How have you? Uh, yeah, it, you don't have to fair, give me a all... secret formula, lads, because I need these. These are fun. It's also the only time that they've ever beaten Salford at the Peninsula in the four meetings there between the two sides since Salford came into the EFL. Um, so it's, it's a uh, really good result, isn't it? Yeah, really good result for them. Um, only goal coming from Andy Cook, who made it 13 for the season. Um, but for me, really, the build-up um, and the kind of determination from Romney Critchlow was to, to keep the Can ball... Can we clone him and make him a midfielder as well? Because he's brilliant. It's just... It's just phenomenal play, like just pure determination goes into one tackle, wins the ball out of it. Second tackle, probably a bit more fortunate. And then just, you know, Andy Cook runs across the box, plays a nice ball in and just fires it in. Um, he scored 13 yeah. goals in 15 appearances in all comps this season, Andy Cook. Re- really impressive so far. And I mean, you know, he's making a real case to not allow Vidal and Oliver anywhere near that starting place. Like, he just sits them better, it's the truth, really. Yeah, I think Vidane, he, he we, does. we know how Verdane plays, and I don't think Brad to quite play that way. They're more possession based than that. Yeah, I mean to be fair, I think Verdane's a bit more of a kind of, I hate to say it, a bit more of a one trick pony. Really, it's sort of he's like he's a very you good know, focal point, Verdane, in a focal point team, but Brad to don't really call for that at times. No, no, I completely agree. I mean, to be fair, even in this game, Salford missed um, golden chances as well. I mean, Callum Hendry shot uh, rattling the underside of the bar, but staying out. Um, you know. Probably can. I'm I'm sure Salford will feel a little bit hard done by for that one. Um, you know, obviously a few of the players protesting that it was over the line, but no buzz from the referee's watch. Um, they don't have yeah. quite this level, do we? No, I suppose not. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely not the miss of the weekend. But I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit later anyway. Mm. Um, but. Yeah, defeat for Salford in this one uh, takes them to four home defeats. Um, and to be fair, they just. Their, their home form really needs to improve, especially if they want to stake their claim at that kind of end of the table. Um, with, with a win here, they could have moved up to third um, and into those automatics. But um, yeah, that, that home form for them really needs to improve if they if they want to keep in these kind of echelons of the table. Yeah, they do. And I'm sure Bantam fans will enjoy getting the better of Elliot Watts as well, who left Brad to Salford 
during the summer. We'll push the time, so I'm going to run through these last three games. Swindon Town 1, Colchester United 0. Uh, initially, a goal disallowed to Fraser Blake Tracy from a corner, but Swindon would eventually get the lead in the second half as a low Johnny Williams cross essentially deflected in off Tyree Shade and rolled into the net. I mean, you always take them, no matter how they come. And a yeah. win for Colchester, for win, win for Swindon, sorry, against Colchester as well. Gillingham won, Stevenage won. Uh, Scott Kashke, I have no words. That is a howler. It's a terrible, terrible miss. There's nothing yeah. more I can really say about that. Uh, worst life. It was absolutely I'm worst sure, life. I'm sure it was. I mean, <laughs> the videos I've seen are really poor, and it's, it's a bad miss from Kashke, certainly. Stevenage got the lead, the league leaders. A brilliant Saxon early cross and a Danny Rose header. But Gillingham got back level with their fifth goal of the league season. A powerful header from Elkham Baggett as well to grab the equaliser. I've really enjoyed him on loan. Coming to Town, by the way, Indonesia International. I think he's been very good to them. And that's a good point to Jills against the league leaders, certainly. And a goalless draw between Leighton Orient and Northampton Town. Nothing to separate the two sides despite chances. The main talking point being a red card for Ben Fox after an aggressive challenge. Why, I don't understand. That is a red. And Liam Shaw tackle for Morecambe isn't a red. Ethel inconsistencies, eh? It's just, it's one rule to some, one rule for others, and the referees seem to make up the mind as they go along, frustratingly. Yeah. But we'll run through the League 2 table to finish. Stevenage still lead the way after their draw, 32 points from 14 games. Leighton Orient after their draw, 30 points from 13 games. They could catch them. Northampton remain third after their draw, 27 from 14. Mansfield Town up to fourth, 26 from 13. Carlisle in fifth, 24 from 13. Bradford and Salford both wrap up the playoff places on 24 points each. That's a fun playoff quartet, by the way. I'd be very happy to see them at the end of the season as well. Swindon Town just outside on 23. Tramway Rovers in flying form on 22. Grinsby on 22 as well. Baron Doncaster on 21 after their defeats. Hartlepool down to the bottom of the table, 9 points from 14 games. Crawley Town, 9 points from 13 games. Colchester United, 9 points from 13. Then Rochdale on 11. Harrogate on 11. Newport on 11. Gillingham on 12. Wimbledon on 12. And Stockport County on 12. There are a lot of people looking over their shoulders right now at the bottom of that League 2 table because it is very tight down there at the moment, for sure. That is going to wrap up this... This episode of D3D4 Football, though, my thank you to David Jenkins, James Richards and James Beck for the contributions today. Cheers, Matt. Yeah, thank you for having me. Brilliant. Join us again next week for more from the world's best third and fourth tiers. We'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>